act like you are friend or foe. Let's uh, define the terms here right off the top. Friend, one attached to another by affection or esteem. Someone who's attached to someone else by affection or esteem, friend. Foe, of course, uh, another word for foe is enemy. Here's the definition of enemy, one that is antagonistic to another. Antagonism. How much antagonism do you experience in an average week? <laughs> Somebody testify. Like a lot, right? Doesn't it feel like there's antagonism everywhere you turn? Or feel like everybody is against you? Or feel like everybody's nasty? Depending on the season of life you're in, you may be experiencing enmity in a very real way. Foe, one that is antagonistic towards another. The problem with having enemies or with people treating you like an enemy is it erases harmony from your life. Put another way, it introduces stress into your life. Can you identify? Are you dealing with uh, relational stress right now? Maybe you're dealing with stress at work. Depending on what uh, research you read, um, stress is the number one mental health issue worldwide, and especially in North America. A lack of harmony, and I think the more stress you experience, the more connected it is to antagonism that you're experiencing in your relational context, because simply put, you have too many enemies. Are you a friend or a foe? I think we could all agree that if given the choice, we would choose more harmony, less stress. Sign me up. More harmony. Have you ever had a season of harmony where just life is good? Maybe you experience moments of harmony. I've mentioned this before, but maybe you're watching me for the first time, and this will be the first time you hear me say it, but next time you find yourself in a moment of perfect happiness, make sure you stop and notice. You're familiar with the phrase, right? Stop and smell the roses. Maybe it's stop and smell the pizza. Stop and smell your beer, you know? Sit still and enjoy this summer night and soak it in and be thankful for it. We could all use a little more harmony in our lives. We would all prefer more friends and fewer foes. So I want to uh, give you five ways to live like a friend this week. And I found these five ways in Philippians chapter 2, verses 19 through 24. Here it is. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state, for I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state, for all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. But you know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. Therefore, I hope to send him at once as soon as I see how it goes with me. But I trust in the Lord that I myself shall also come shortly. One thing I like about this section, not really preaching on this, but I love how personal this is. This is like a, a glimpse into the personal moments in Paul's letter to the Philippians. This is, it's almost like housekeeping. The section in my Bible is Timothy commended. So he's planning to send his assistant, his friend Timothy, to serve the Philippian church because Paul can't come. And he's basically introducing them to Timothy and uh, telling them to, you know, trust him and uh, take care of him. Why? For I have no one else like-minded. This is where I get the uh, friend or foe hook for, for this sermon. He's sending his friend Timothy. Why? Because he has no one else like-minded. Everyone else he either doesn't trust or is against him. Remember here that Paul is in prison when he's writing this letter to the Philippian church. I just want to uh, point out off the top two cool things. One, verse 19 sounds an awful lot like verse 24. This section is bookended with the concept of trust. Verse 19, but I trust in the Lord. And then verse 24, but I trust in the Lord. We'll um, talk about those two kinds of trusts coming up here in just a moment. The uh, first way to live like a friend is to live expectantly. I get this out of uh, verse 19, but I trust. So you can trust. What does that have to do with um, expectation? Well, in the original language, he literally says, but I am expecting. I'm expecting to send Timothy to you 
shortly. He has an expectation of something that he's about to do. Let me just point out that even while he's in prison, Paul is still making plans. So that'll, uh, that'll preach for you. Are you in prison? Are you in a season of restriction? Even in that season, don't stop making plans. But I trust in the Lord Jesus. Paul has an expectation, and that expectation is affecting his actions. So friendly or harmonious living is expectant living. And here's what I wanted to ask you. Have you lost your hope? Have you stopped expecting good things? I can relate to this very personally. Um, I am living in a season of, you know, real difficulty and transition. And I've had to um, guard my heart because I have found myself having days where, I mean, it's hyperbolic to say I've lost hope, but I'm feeling pretty close, feeling pretty close to the edge. Like, I don't know how much longer I can do this. I don't know how much more of this I can put up with. And maybe you find yourself in that kind of season right now. So I just wanted to talk to you for a minute and just ask, have you lost your hope? Or do you feel on the verge? If you want to live a more harmonious, a more friendly life, you need to do the hard work of regaining your hope. You need to do the hard work of refusing to let yourself completely let go of expectation. This can be really tough. Um, again, when you're dealing, say you have a relationship that is tough because the person you're in relationship with has consistently let you down. And they do it again and again, and they never seem to change, and you trust them again, and then they do the same thing again. And this has worn down not just your trust, but your expectation over time. You don't trust them because you expect them in a twisted way to do the wrong thing. I want to just invite you again to believe. I want to invite you again to trust. I want to invite you again to, I mean, reach as deep as you got to deep, reach as deep as you have to reach, and, and find that last little shred of expectation and hold on to it for all your worth. It's no mistake that the Bible talks about God's friends as being like little children. And one thing we know about little children is they always hope that there's going to be more ice cream. They always believe that on the other end of this rainy day, uh, the sun will come out tomorrow. They always have an ongoing expectation of good things. This is one of the reasons why when you see kids who come from really desperate situations, horribly broken homes, one of the worst things you can ever see is the death of hope in the eyes of a young child. But I want to invite you to lift your eyes again, to begin to hope again, to find some renewed expectation in your life. But you're wondering, well, how? How can I regain that sense of expectation? You can do this, point number two now, by um, sharing in the divine point of view. We get this out of verse 20 when Paul says, for I have no one like-minded. So he's implying that Timothy is like-minded, that Timothy shares Paul's point of view. The like-mindedness he's talking about here is gospel-mindedness. Paul is an apostle. He is a minister of the good news of Jesus. He's a missionary. He's been spreading the story and the way of Jesus from Israel into the Roman world. His whole life is oriented around and built upon the story of Jesus and its implications. And Timothy clearly is on the same page with him. That's why Paul is sending Timothy to the Philippian church. He says, I have no one else like-minded. I just wanted to point out here that Paul and Timothy's connection is a gospel connection. It's a good news connection. Their connection is connected to the story of God and his people in which they have found their place. They are like-minded because they share a gospel point of view. I just wanted to ask you to consider this statement. I believe that the degree to which your life is metered through the story of God and his people is the degree to which you can expect to experience harmony. Now, let me just say harmony, I think, is different than ease. I'm not saying that, you know, if you walk in the story of God, the more you do so, the easier your life is going to get. But I do believe that as you walk in the story of God and his people, as you begin to learn what that story is and what it's about, and as you begin to abide in it, as you begin to walk the way that Jesus walked, you will experience more and more harmony. 
Put another way, harmony is like peace. Do you have someone with whom you're just at peace? You just kind of sit quietly and you don't have to say a word? That's harmony. I believe when you walk in the story of God, you experience that kind of harmony that otherwise is missing. I think this is why so many people who seem really successful, seem to have their lives all together, secretly on the inside, um, they're in turmoil. Secretly on the inside, they are stressed out. Why? Because they are missing harmony. Why? Well, I believe many people miss out on harmony because they are not connected relationally to the God of the universe. I believe that's why you exist, to be God's friend forever. And so when you exist outside of the bounds of that friendship, regardless of whatever else happens in your life, you will find yourself lacking harmony. If you want to have more harmony in your life, let me just urge you to consider embracing the divine point of view. Like, well, Todd, I don't know what the divine point of view is. Well, you can learn the divine point of view by studying the Bible. You can begin to study the story of God and his people. You can listen to preaching like this from the Bible about Jesus, about God and his people. Find a local church and get involved. Find some people who've been following Jesus for years and start building your life with them. Watch how they live and begin in as much as you can, mimicking them, doing the things that you see them doing. Learn the story and then live the story. Embrace the divine point of view. And you can do this short form. This is the big theme, the big idea of the book of Philippians point three now by getting more and more other focused over time. We get this out of uh, verses 20 through 22. I'll read them here for you. For I have no one else like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. But you know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. So um, here's where we get the others focused idea from. For I have no one else like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. Why? For all seek their own. So Paul here is saying that most people are just looking out for number one. What's really interesting about the Bible is that oftentimes many of the themes and issues that the Bible explores are still very much in play in our age of the world. How many people do you know for whom self is the number one objective? Is it safe to say most of the people that we know um, are oriented first and foremost around them self? Is it safe to say, do you tend to agree with me that that is kind of the, the primary teaching of our culture? To follow your heart, to believe in yourself, to trust your instincts, to do what's right for you, to define the truth for yourself. Paul's saying that he has no one who's like-minded except Timothy, because everyone else around him only seeks their own. A friend is others focused. This is beautiful, right? Like you know this to be true just from your experience in the world, right? Like I bet you, you don't have too many good friends who are completely focused on themselves, right? It's a very good chance that people you consider friends are people who spend at least some of their energy focused on you. It's one of the things that attracts you to them, that they are others focused in the immediate context. They are focused on you and you are focused on them. There's a reciprocal nature to the relationship. Nobody wants to be friends with an egomaniac. You ever been around somebody like this? They won't ever stop talking about themselves. Just eventually just roll your eyes and find an excuse to move on to the next person at the party, right? If you find yourself <laughs> in a situation where you're talking a little bit too much about yourself, just, just shut up, stop it, and ask them questions about them self. A friend is others focused. If you want a more harmonious life, let me just invite you. This is really tactical, like really practically to make sure moment by moment that you are focusing on the other person. This is a teaching that is central to almost all spiritual teaching throughout almost all religious traditions. Put simply, the sages, the philosophers, the prophets are all saying the same thing. Get off the throne. <laughs> Get off the throne. You're not God. Okay? The fuss is not about you. Get off the throne. Maybe you're thinking, Todd, all these spiritual teachings, they're just stories, right? They're just stories. Well, speaking of stories, if you want more harmony in your life, 
You need to know and live according to the right story. This is uh, point number four. We get this out of uh, verse 22. But you know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. Really fun here. The word served is slaved. (laughs) He worked like a slave in the service of the gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel is the good news, the story about Jesus that had changed Paul's life completely, that had changed Timothy's life completely, that was in the early stages of changing the history of the Roman Empire completely. Paul is saying that Timothy is a good friend, a faithful servant, because he slaved with Paul in the service of the big story, the good news about God and his people. So let me just ask you to think about your story. We touched on this last week. The story that you are organizing your life around, is it big enough, is it true enough to introduce or invite into your life the harmony that you want? You're like, oh, touche preacher, right? Because if you're lacking harmony, if your life is full of stress and angst, that's pretty good evidence that your story, your cosmology, the story you're telling yourself um, isn't really working. So look, I'm a gospel preacher, right? Like I believe in Jesus and the story of Jesus has completely changed my life. I'm trying to hold you in my heart if for you this is all very new. So I just wanna invite you to take one step today. If I'm talking to you right now, you're like, yes, my my story is failing me because I lack harmony. You, You just got me, you just hit me right between the eyes. Okay, so then would you consider Jesus? Consider Jesus. Stay with me for a few weeks here as we continue to tell the story of Jesus and his people through the context of Paul's letter to the Philippian church. Find some other good Bible preachers to listen to and begin absorbing the story of God and his people. Start reading the Bible for yourself. Start praying, start listening to God, start talking to him. Start orienting your life around the story as you begin to understand it. And then maybe send me a note in like six months or a year with a report on how your harmony level has changed. I have never met anyone in my life who has stepped into the story of God and begun walking it out, who has not come back sometime later, it can be weeks, months, sometimes it's years later, and reported that they are the happier for it. Their life is better. They're glad, like I've never met anyone. Now does that mean there's no one out there who would tell you a contrary story? Well, perhaps, but I'm talking from my experience here. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. I believe that as you begin to walk in this story, it will pay dividends in your life. In this case, it will bring more harmony into your life. Why? Because you'll begin living your life aligned with the life of God. This is ultimately what the gospel is all about. It's about God inviting you back into relationship with him. Because of the work of Jesus Christ upon his cross, where he breaks the power of Satan, sin, death, and hell once and for all. Because of what Jesus did, harmony now is possible for you. You can begin living a more harmonious life as you begin living that life in relationship with Jesus. For me, a deep source of harmony is simply knowing that I've been adopted into God's family, that I belong to him, that I'm not an orphan, that I'm not alone, that even when some of my friends forsake me, he will never forsake me. He sticks closer than a brother. And I gotta tell you, in the dark (laughs) nights of the soul, it's very nice to know that God still loves you. And I just gotta testify that that's a physical feeling. I lie there and I can sense the love of God. I can feel the affection that he has for me. And that's changing everything. Knowing that I belong to him, knowing that I'm his friend, This breeds a deep, unshakable confidence, the kind of confidence that can overcome almost any obstacle, which is why Paul bookends this section in Philippians with the same words that we started with. Verse 24 as we close, but I trust. In the first case in verse 19, but I trust is but I have expectation. Here it's beautiful. Second time trust comes up, different Greek word. Oh, but I have confidence. Hallelujah. Isn't it beautiful? His expectation, his hope has led to 
confidence. I have confidence. If you want to have confidence, you can start by inviting more friendship, more harmony into your life. To do that, begin living expectantly again. Don't let nobody break your soul. Don't let nobody steal your joy. Don't let nobody crush your dreams. Reclaim your expectations. Learn and begin to share the divine point of view. What does God think about how you're living? How has He intended you to live? What design does He have in mind for you? Figure that out and begin living in accordance with it, and you will have more harmony. Simply learn to be others focused. This is as easy as one, two, three. Moment by moment, take the focus off yourself, put it on the person you're with. And then learn and embrace the right story. To embrace means to hug, to hold close. As the story of Jesus begins to bubble up in your life with all its beauty and all its goodness, hold it close, embrace it. Because you'll find yourself living confidently as a result, like um, one of God's friends. Good morning. We are honored to be with you this morning. Thank you to the Canelons for this opportunity. Mano and I have been involved in work in Kenya since the early 2000s and really believe that we are living in an unprecedented time in what Marshall McLuhan called the global village that has opened opportunity for us to be involved globally while living locally here in Canada. Kenya itself has over 3 million orphans and vulnerable children. And because of that, we are looking to avoid costly models of orphan care, often the only hurdle for children to be supported within local families, in local communities, is the cost of an extra mouth to feed or the cost of school fees to be paid. And for that reason, we are coming alongside local Kenyans to care for their own. REACT wants to see the most vulnerable children thrive. Orphans with urgent medical needs caused by HIV AIDS with no other recourse are cared for at the Veronica Home. There, their health can be stabilized before they return to their community. We found this simple, cost-effective, and culturally relevant way of caring for orphans and vulnerable children has enabled us to be the hands and feet of Jesus in a culturally relevant way. Most of us know complex things break down, simple things multiply. We are looking to deliberately stay simple, organic, in the way that we care for children and orphans in Kenya. We always strive to send 100% of funds overseas to Kenya and only have volunteers on our end to keep overhead down. If you'd like to learn more, check out reactkenya.com. All right, so uh, React Kenya and Mike and Mano Christensen are our partners for our hands and feet jar. We've talked about this um, throughout the series. So at the end of each month, I um, place a percentage of our earnings into this jar. And so this month, I'm putting 16% of uh, last month's earnings into this jar. And once it uh, hits $1,000, we will give it to React Kenya and they will use it to do good in the world. So I'm really thrilled to announce that the jar uh, now has 520 bucks in it. So we're halfway there. So I really can't wait until uh, we get to uh, give this to Mike and Manoa and bring you a good report on what they did with the money. If you would like to uh, join us on that generosity journey and also get involved in funding this channel, you can do so online. You can become a patron of Unchurched with Pastor Todd by visiting patreon.com slash unchurched. And another way that you can support this work is simply by liking uh, this video, by subscribing to this channel. And uh, if today's word spoke to you, please share it within your sphere of influence. It's real easy. You can just press pause and then click share and send this message out to everyone you know. We really do appreciate your support. And we're just thrilled to uh, see that uh, right now the average is 2,000 people a week are tuning in to watch Unchurched with Pastor Todd. That's the average over our first eight weeks together. And that is pretty awesome. I was hoping we'd have more than 100 people show up and hear you are. Let me just uh, pray for you as we wrap up our time together today. Lord, thank you for each one who's watching. Thank you, Lord, that uh, you are on the journey with them. 
Lord, we want to be your friends. Lord, we want to learn what it means to follow you. Lord, we want to walk in your ways. Would you continue to teach those ways to us? Would you show us how to live? Would you lead us into situations this week where we can act like we're your friends? And Lord, particularly, I just uh, pray over these dear ones listening right now who have lost their hope and for whom the concept of resurrecting expectation is they still haven't gotten over the first point in the sermon. Lord, would you do that work in their heart by the Holy Spirit? Even now, Lord, as I pray, would they begin to sense hope beginning to be restored in their hearts? And Lord, we look forward to good reports as they uh, turn the corner by your grace. In Jesus' good name, amen. Hey, look, if you've got a good report for me, I'd love to hear from you. Toddcandelon at gmail.com is my email. I'd love to interact with you. And again, please like, share, and subscribe to the channel. And I will see you next.